Deputy about a year and a half ago, and, and they put a little sign out front, you know, thank you for your service with some, you know, little kid pictures and stuff, you know, like stickers and stuff like that. At any rate, it was a nice gesture. And uh, they, uh-huh. didn't, they didn't go inside. They didn't ask for anything. You know, they just put the sign out there. Well, we met a police officer about a year later, and uh, my wife had mentioned the sign. He goes, oh, my gosh, we, we all love that sign. We can believe that somebody put it out there. And that just felt so good, A, to teach our kids the power of gratitude for our civil servants, but also to teach our kids that, you know, it's, it's okay to reach out and be proactive and thank people for what they do. And, and it was noticed at, the, at a level we never imagined, you know, so it was kind of neat. Yeah, that's really cool. So um, when, you, cool. when you were done working at the department, uh, did you leave the department and go straight into uh, private investigative work, or were you looking for something different, or how did things unfold well, for you? I was actually – it was just a, just a, you know, a lot of little pieces fell into place. Uh, there was um, four of us law enforcement officers at the department we were at that decided to start doing a little um, bodyguard and private investigation work on the side. So we ended up creating a little business and it didn't last very long, but that's kind of what got me started because I was already doing that and a lot of uh, personal protection stuff on the side, which, you know, um, can lead into a lot of investigative functions too. So I was doing a lot of that. I'd done a lot of bodyguarding throughout my law enforcement career for extra money. Um, and that kind of just, uh, you know, snowballed to a point where it was like, you know, as an investigator on the civilian side of things, I can literally take a case from start to finish and, have the empathy and, you know, the love for people's, you know, situations and, and solve and, and maybe not solve is not the right word, but, you know, help them get through a very hard point in their life uh-huh. with answers either way. Uh-huh. Um, and being that kind of advocate for, for those people's lives. And it just was such a life altering change to, you know, what I considered was a skill set that, you know, could only be in law enforcement. And then here's this, occupation kind of growing in my lap and it kind of just grew with word of mouth very quickly uh, to the point where it's like I just had to make a decision I could you know make a living doing personal protection and investigations which eventually just led to straight investigations um that's kind of just an tra- easy transition I, I love that you took a skill set that you that you had in a career job that most people think ends there and you created something out of that because I, I don't think enough people give credit for the skill set that they have in their careers or in, in maybe even a hobby that they had to turn it into something that they can actually love, enjoy, and make money or make a living at. And that's exactly what you've done so far. I mean, your investigative work, yeah. you know, looking at your website, everything looks to be on par. You've got some great referrals on there and, and from what I see and, and hear, you, you stay very busy with your investigative work. Uh, I stay extremely busy. And, you know, like I've, you know, last couple of years kind of had to come to, you know, uh, a come to Jesus type moment where I was losing so much work to big national companies. Yeah. Um, and a lot of my fellow, you know, one man unit, you know, private investigation companies, same problem. And then, you know, even when we get the jobs, we're getting them from, you know, other large companies that are selling them back to us at a fraction of what we should be making on them. And I just, you know, decided I needed to do something about it. And I've always been a good private investigator, um, obviously made my mistakes and always had things to learn and, uh, you know, um, be humble about as I've gone through the process in the last 12 years of being a private investigator. But I did, I wasn't a great businessman. And that's what in the last couple of years I've, I really had to learn um, teaching myself marketing and educating myself on websites and SEO and all this good stuff that, um, you know, I never thought I needed because I just thought, oh, I'm just going to be an investigator, you know, and the rest of that will just come. But in order to survive, I've had to kind of take on a new, new uh, light, you know, as a business person also to combat these, uh, what I call them, the Walmart syndromes and investigations that are buying up all the SEO because that's where, you know, most people are looking now. Word of mouth seems to be, um, you know, not dying, but it just seems less and less where that's where it comes from. More people are, you know, easier to pop on their phone and search and jump on search engine and search for a private investigator. Um, and you just got to, you know, kind of reinvent yourself, which is what I've done. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you give us any of those uh, names and faces have changed to protect the innocent stories? Are over? <laughs> is there any fun, anything fun you could tell us? I think people would want to hear something. 
Well, you know, it's, it's funny is because everything we do is interesting, but you know, like anything, uh, sometimes it's just, it's just what you do every day. Uh, you know, I just got do- off of a case, um, you know, for the last 40 days, almost, almost, almost every day. Um, whereas, uh, uh, socialite, very rich socialite in her eighties, um, her family having concern with a guy that is now moved in and kind of running her life. Uh-huh. Um, this company is worth, uh, you know, millions and millions of dollars. I won't get into the how many millions, but just to say it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this guy was, you know, the driving Miss Daisy, uh, you know, driver who is now shacked up with her. Um, and the family had a lot of concerns. So, you know, we had to put into an investigation uh, that was not easy because people with means, um, you know, have, you know, security on their, on their you know, housing units or, uh, you know, everything's, it's so much harder. And not to mention about a week into our, our case, uh, the lady decides to buy our guy that we're following, a brand new Bentley. Um, so we went from following a Cadillac, which is a little easier, um, to a brand spanking new Bentley. And the challenges were amazing. Um, to follow this vehicle um, and the and, uh, family drama yeah. <laughs> of it all and try to figure out what this guy was up to. Um, I, in the end, I think the guy, I've had three of these in the last decade or so. Um, you know, we were pretty positive the guy um, had a boyfriend. And uh, this, like I said, I've had a, a three of these where it's it's kind of a scam and they're with an elderly woman and they we wiggle their way in because uh, I mean let's be honest more than likely probably not a whole lot of sexual activity going at that age yeah um I could be wrong but let's just try to think about that yeah but uh <laughs> sure. um you know as a you know a gay man probably affectionate much more than probably you and I and probably easily could play those roles and biding their time until that person is going to pass away or give them enough stuff till they till they leave. Um, and I think there's a atypical story of that going on. I mean, the guy gets a three hundred thousand dollar car, like you and I would go buy a pair of shoes, um, <laughs> and stuff like that. It's just that the guy is, uh, you know, up to no good as far as you know the relationship yeah. uh, is concerned. It's up the family's got to deal with all that drama now that we've figured it all out. But um, you know, that type of thing, it could be pretty exciting. It was, you know, going to a lot of restaurants and, and uh, uh, most, you know, establishments that are way above my pay grade on the client's dime was always fun. You know, it's getting to experience some things how the other half does, if you know what I mean. Yeah, sure, sure. So it's not just on TV that these things happen because I think I've seen that show several times. <laughs> no, nope, it's real life. It's real life, that's for sure. This guy was uh, – you know, it's kind of funny because originally the client had told us that he was the van driver. In my mind, I'm thinking like, you know, the vans you see, you know, taking people to the airport or something like that. No, this was like a $400,000 Mercedes Sprinter van. Yeah. Um, that was the van driver. So it's you, like your perspective on on what you're, <laughs> what you're investigating is completely off on how those people live. Yeah. Um, to change topics a little bit, so you're working as a PI – how does one wind up on the History Channel from uh, being doing investigative work? <laughs> well, that was actually an absolute complete accident. Um, I was kind of slow at the time, so I was uh, cruising classified ads and, and stuff like that. And um, for sometimes insurance companies will put up postings on needing investigators. So I was, you know, going through that kind of stuff, and I came across in one of the investigative things I believe it was on Craigslist. Um, where you know a production company was looking for a private investigator, uh-huh. and I had heard they were filming out at Superstition Mountains here in Arizona, so I kind of assumed just based on a quick read that that's what they were looking for, and uh, so I put in for it. Um, it turns out I was two weeks late for putting in for it, so <laughs> they actually passed the deadline. But within four hours, I had the executive producer of Pilgrim, which Pilgrim Productions was one of the largest reality show. Um, you know, makers here in the United States. Uh, they, he was on the phone with me because apparently, you know, they have this idea of what they want for a show. You know uh-huh. what I mean? Sure. And they had had someone in my role, and you know, he was just going to basically fill that role, but it wasn't what they wanted. Apparently, I was. You know what I mean? Uh huh. Um. So, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And then two weeks later, I was in Alaska, which is unheard of. 
most of these guys, like the other two guys that I was, I was with, um, they were, uh, you know, on board for 18 months and about six months. You know what I mean? It, it took them a long time. Well, it's a good thing you were slow with your PI work at the time, right? <laughs> you were able to go. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, and, you know, taking something like this is I had to literally drop my life for, uh, well, it was going to be straight 13 weeks. But then what happened was um, one of the cast members, uh, another investigator, he got um, really injured in a fall. So we had to split for about three weeks, three months, uh-huh. and then we came back. So it ended up being almost a five-month process um, where your life was just literally about the show um, and happened to have uh, everything at home handled by other people. Yeah, so so what was it like to be on set and, and filming this show? What what was the show about? I mean, it, clearly it's just missing in Alaska, but what, what was it all about? Well, um, you know, like the Bermuda Triangle where people go missing, there's actually 13 spots in the, you know, in the world that have this triangle effect of um, an overabundance of missing people, or missing planes, and missing objects also. I'm already, um, so, so, I'm already so glad I asked this question. Please, <laughs> please tell us. <laughs> <laughs> so Alaska, a triangle that's kind of through the base of Alaska, um, has an overabundance. Uh, of, of these, just like the Bermuda Triangle. Um, and uh, Alaskan folklore through Alaskan natives, which are very different than lower 48 natives, um, completely different subject. But Alaskan natives um, have a lot of folklore as to why people go missing. Um, you know, and a lot of folklore and legend stuff are created to keep kids away from the water and that kind of stuff. I mean, it has a, a, like a parenting type basis to it or scary, you know, scary campfire stuff. Uh-huh. Um, Anyways, uh, yeah, so we had, you know, Tommy Joseph, was he's an Alaskan um, folklore and historian, and, uh, you know, his, basically his day job is to make, um, you know, Alaskan art, and he's been in the White House. Uh, I made President Obama a, uh, a uh, ornament for his tree. I mean, he was, been, he's, you know, he travels all over the place. And, and the funny thing is Alaskan natives are very similar to New Zealand natives. So he, he goes back and forth between there, which is kind of interesting sidebar. And then, uh, you know, uh, Ken Gerard ended up being a, a cryptozoologist, which I had no idea what that was when I first started. Um, it's kind of a study of things that go bump in the night. Okay. <laughs> um, so a lot of paranormal and, uh, you know, mythical type creatures, uh, you know, is what this guy does on a daily basis. Um, him and I uh, had a rough start, but him and I are a great, are a great, for great friends, great friends, my upbringing and stuff like that uh, were completely kind of against where he was with his beliefs on stuff. But uh, you know what will solve that really quickly? Uh, 18 hours out in a freezing, um, you know, Alaskan uh, bearing mountains, mountainside and trees and forests is um, when you're relying on each other for to make it through uh, the day, um, those things go away really quickly and you stop hearing about, um, you know, differences like that. Yeah, I bet. So, um, you know, the three of us were out there investigating uh, missing people um, and, you know, basically storylines of, of different pro- probabilities with Alaskan folklore. And my job as an investigator was just to keep the team on, you know, an investigative process. Um, you know, it's definitely you know, made for TV, but a lot of it was very real. Um, it was a lot of fun. It was a once in a lifetime experience, you know, getting, uh, you know, helicoptered and uh, spelunking in ice caves and all these things are, Things I, I love to do, and I probably do a couple of them a year. But I was able to do, you know, every single day doing something that uh, you know most people would dream of, um, you know, danger and adventure-wise. Yeah, S- sounds pretty amazing. So uh, th- this was a couple years ago, right? Or how long ago has it been? We're probably uh, I think we're just now pushed three years. Oh wow! Okay. So it's been about three years. So um, you know. It's still playing in other places, but with, uh, you know, reality television, it's a whole other subject there. But, um, you know, the, the production companies and the networks are who makes the money. Um, the people involved that you're actually watching um, are very, very minimal, actually, um, for reality shows compared to what they're actually bringing in for these things. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Well, it's just fascinating to me how your career has transitioned, but clearly you've said yes a couple times to some neat projects. Um, so, so now you mentioned earlier on the show that you're doing some production. I know you're doing some filming right now. What are some of the things on your, uh, on your plate right now that you can tell us about? 
Well, we have just got done accepting an award on behalf of uh, 